Hey, Brand Builder, Rory Vaden here. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to this interview. We are so excited to bring you this information and wanted to let you know that, hey, there's no sales pitch coming uh, from anything that we do. This is all our value add to you and the community. However, if you are somebody who is looking for specific strategies on how to build and monetize your personal brand, we would love to talk to you. And we offer a free call to uh, everyone that's interested in getting to know us and is willing to give us a chance to get to know them and share a little bit about what we do. So if you're interested in taking us up on a free strategy call, you can do that at brandbuildersgroup.com slash summit call. brandbuildersgroup.com slash summit call. Hope to talk to you soon. On with the show. Holy moly, friends. I, you're about to have your world rocked by one of my newer friends who I absolutely adore and admire. Um, Elizabeth Ryder is her name, and she is incredible. So she's a nutritionist. She's a, uh, an author. Uh, she has a book, a great book that just came out called The Health Habit. She's uh, you know a health coach and an online business mentor, but she is one of the like OGs of blogging and building an audience. And if you go to your, if you go to her website, so she's she's a seven figure. She's turned it into a seven figure business, which we're going to talk about. If you go to her website. Um, you'll see, you know, we'll put links to it, but elizabethwriter.com, um, you know, there's over a hundred thousand people on her email list, which is very public, but what you wouldn't know, unless you were friends with her like me and we call her Liz and not Elizabeth cause we're friends is that this woman is getting 700,000 to a million page views a month of pure organic traffic from Google, from her blog. So to give you a frame of reference, like at my peak as a blogger, I was around 100,000 uh, views in a month. So this is like 10 times beyond uh, as on an average of where I've ever been at, at the best. So I, I, I was like, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta have her. So anyways, she's the coolest, she's here. And Elizabeth, thanks for making time for us. Thanks Rory, wow, that's a lot. It's a lot to live up to, I feel like. But well, it's all true. The page views especially, that's what I want, <laughs> I want to talk to people about. <laughs> yeah, so, so I want to just hammer that directly, right? Like, because mm -hmm. social media is like, it's like the world of, um, it, it's like in, in golf, you know, they say like you drive for show, but you putt for dough. And, and social media is like the drive, like, oh, you can drive the ball 350 yards, but it's like the people who make the money know how to putt. And I just want like, I just want your perspective on social media versus blogging because I don't think people hear it. I don't think that's what you hear people talking about. Yeah, for sure. Like, let me just say this. I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts about that. I'm going to preempt it all with saying everything I'm about to say doesn't mean that social media is bad or not good or useful because I still use it too. So this is not Amen. to say that none of it's useful, but I see an epidemic that I needs to be corrected, especially with people coming into building brands right now where they want to spend all of their time. And I'm going to use Instagram as like the place, right? Because we're in the zeitgeist where Instagram is the place that people want to be. And again, it's not bad. I'm on Instagram too. But when I, when it comes to like this, like long-term idea of people seeing your content and building a brand and getting, establishing yourself and using your time well, this is what I want to talk about. Instagram or Facebook or any of them, maybe 1% of your audience, you know, maybe if you're really highly engaged, three to 5% of your audience sees all of your posts, right? And they see it within 24 hours and then it goes into your feed or onto your grid or into whatever it is. And it's, it does happen, but it's very rare that someone scrolls back through maybe five posts, even think about a hundred posts, yeah. maybe, right? Like a deep like, you know, when somebody deep likes one of your photos and you're like, whoa, they were deep on my feed to like that. You know what I mean? It doesn't <laughs> happen very often. And it's like yeah. what you never want to happen when you're like scrolling, like maybe you find your, uh, your significant other's ex or like, you know, someone who you don't want them to know that you're looking at their stuff. You're like, don't like anything. Make sure that you don't accidentally double tap something. <laughs> this is like my example all the time, but it's rare, right? Right. And what I see is people, you know, spending so much time crafting this content that maybe a hundred people see, 
if even, right? If, if you have a large brand, maybe a thousand, 2000 people see it. If you're just starting out, maybe a few people see it, but then it gets buried, right? And none of that is cataloged in the search engines. Now let's talk Crazy. about- Crazy. Let's talk about a blog where I have a post that I wrote in my sweatpants eight years ago that sends 80 to 100,000 people a month to my blog still from wow. eight years every, ago. every month. Every month. And in turn, I, the, you know, a percentage of those people get on my email list. That's the granola post on my Healthy Homemade Granola post. I just wrote a post and I want to also make sure everybody knows it's not just because I wrote it eight years ago. That one happens to be there. A post I wrote last year is the number one ranked um, Google search for easy to peel hard boiled eggs. So in that, I just wrote that last year. So I don't want people to think, well, yeah, that was eight years ago, right? Like you can write a post now. Right, that because over out. time, right. Over time, because yeah. yeah, it'll it'll become it. So what I want to, what I, what I really stress for the people who I coach and, and anybody who asks me about this, I'm like, look, your blog is the home of your business. It's cataloged by Google and it lives there forever. Mm. And if you do it right, if you know how to do it, you will get traffic literally perpetually forever that can continue to build and continue to grow um, and continue to put people on your email list to see your products and services. You can continue to serve where that same amount of time could have been spent on an Instagram post that's now buried 80 posts deep that no one's ever going to see again. So it's kind of like, you know, I think people, and, and I'm going to, this might be a little bit of tough love, but you've really got to humble yourself to be like, I don't need to be part of the popularity contest on Instagram. What I need mm. to do is take my time and serve my blog so that I can continue to reach readers and pr potential clients and customers forever. I love that. You know, I, I'm thinking of a parallel here with money. You know, there's a, a metaphor I heard a long time ago that, you know, uh, growing your wealth is like growing an army. And when you spend a dollar, it's like you kill off one of your soldiers when you invest a dollar, that is like a soldier multiplying, like it sort of, you know, kind of spawns when you, that's almost how this is. It's like when you spend all this time on a social media post, people see it once and then it's gone forever. Mm -hmm. When you put that into a post that is, is cataloged on your blog, Google is driving traffic to it. And the older it's almost like from a Google perspective, the older it is, the better it is. Like the, the, it, it, can, it can be really valuable. Yeah. There's something, and I want to make this clear to people. I'll give everybody a tip here. Um, it does, it establishes that Google, Google wants to continue to send people to things that they know people like, which are being clicked on and people are spending time on the page. Google also likes old posts being updated because it they, knows that the site is fresh. So like the healthy homemade granola, once a year I'll go in there and maybe update the photo or like, you know, I've, I've updated a few of the sentences. So um, you don't have to do that, but Google does like that. I never change the URL. Don't ever change your URL, that's really important. But you can even add to it, you know, I've gone in there and been like, hey, this is now one of the most popular granola recipes on the internet. Um, you, can, you can continue to update it. But yes, it, it likes the longevity when building the, the site. So start so doing it now. The point of that is start doing it now. Do don't it now. Don't wait another year or two years or three years to start blogging. And, and so I think it'd be fun to talk about Google here a little bit because everyone hears about like hashtags and like follow and, and, you know, hitting the search page or the for you page or whatever, but Google is like the ultimate search engine. And I think a lot of authors and content creators don't really understand that much about, um, you know, how does, how does Google work? So like, is there anything that you kind of do to, to, to sort of think in your mind, okay, with every post, like, is there any kind of checklist that you go through for yeah. that? That's actually my new program called Blog It Like It's Hot. I actually have an entire program, but I would love to share for free with all of your listeners. Blog It Like It's Hot. Love Blog it. it Like It's Hot is my new course because that's the problem is people are like, well, how do I do that, right? So I give everybody an exact checklist and you know, after, after a certain period of time that becomes second nature. So I don't even need to use a checklist, but I'll, you know, I give everybody a checklist. One thing you really want to do is name your post. The title of your post needs to be what somebody would Google. Right. So like one of the reasons that that, you know, like if we look at easy to peel hard boiled eggs, uh, people, I didn't, I didn't call the post the trick to peeling hard boiled eggs or don't make this mistake when you peel hard boiled eggs or something like, and, and Google might, Google would find that, but the just easy to peel hard boiled eggs, it's like, boom, that's the title of the post. And that's what somebody Googled. 
Google's. Now, Google did make an update to the algorithm at the end of 2009 to have more of like predictive called BERT. We don't need to get into like the analytics and the, the um, technical side of that. But what it just means is that there is predictive, the, ser the search engine um, is smart enough to kind of predict what they think the person is trying to find. So there is some logic built into that. But, you know, for the most part, it's really important to name your post what it actually is and what somebody would Google. Whereas like an email list, when you're emailing, you know, for the subject line, you might use like a headline, right? Or like a question, or you're trying to get people to open the email. That's different than like what you would title the post. Just make sure your That's post title. That's great. Yeah. So your post title and the email subject line are different. Um, but just make sure your post title is what somebody would Google. That's super, super important. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like like an email subject line might be like curiosity or shock or whatever, yeah. but it's like your post on your page needs to be the like the almost like it could be very literal, boring because yes. yes. but it's it, what the person would type in. Yes. And and so how do you know? Like so do you are you like in the back of Google Ads all day every day? Like are you in Google Analytics looking and f f being like which of my posts are ranking and traffic or like what's how do you keep score? That's really interesting. I don't that much. So I I teach things a little different because so you can look at keywords and you can do that. I don't use Google Ads at this moment. I could in the future. I don't use ads. There's a there's a keyword tool in AdWords that people can log into and mm -hmm. search keywords. I always tell people like, look, and I think this is what makes me different in like the blogging teacher sphere. If researching keywords worked and you just blogged off of researching keywords, everybody who ever did that would have millions of views and they don't, right? So the way I teach blogging is like one, it kind of goes back to what you guys teach about a personal brand. It's got to like fit into your, the, the, um, how you serve and what you teach, right? So, and when you know your customer, when you are connected to your mission and your customer, I know what my customer is Googling. How easy to peel hard boiled eggs, right? Like uh, how, how to make healthy homemade granola. These are all things that I know that my customer would Google. And I think that blogging has to be enjoyable. This is all stuff I'm doing in my, like this is stuff I eat and stuff I'm doing in my real life. I'm not blogging about things that I don't use or eat. So, you know, the, tr the actual definition of blog is weblog. And it was intended to be just a, web, a log on the web of your daily life, right? That's what a personal blog started out as. And now it's, you know, we use them in many different ways. But for me, it's like, I, I stay in my lane of, I know like my blog is about healthy recipes and practical tips for healthy living. That's, that's where I, that's where I, I stay. I also have, you know, category for business for when I do that. Um, you know, I always tell people have three to five categories of your, on your blog, not more, right? Hmm. You don't want to dilute yourself. You're going to see five categories on my blog something's going to fall in there. And really for me, the way I decide what I'm going to post, I do have, you know, a map out a calendar, but if the week, if I want to change it that week, if I'm like, wow, I made this instead, or, you know, this recipe just came up, I, I change things on the fly too. But I actually, I, keyword research can be, can be useful, but it's also when you have a personality brand and a personality based business, you're blogging about what you're doing, right. And about what you teach and what you're good at. Sure. It, but but so you're not you're not like a huge like into Google Analytics or using you know crazy tools. Just every once in a while, you'll get a yeah. report from like somebody who will send you a report or something. Yeah, I look at my Google Analytics. I mean, absolutely, you need to have it installed. I I look at it probably once a month. What I think is super valuable for me for with Google Analytics is that I can see those really high traffic posts that are performing well. Google does want to see those updated or just that they've been touched at least once a year, just because it still says, "Hey, I'm still here." Like some, someone's the gatekeeper of this. I might update an image, I might update something, but I also make sure like midway through the post, I have an extra special banner or something that's like, hey, get on my email list. Like, hey, if you're loving this, this mm. post, make sure, you know, cause you can include extra calls to action in those really um, high performing posts to make sure that, um, that you're, you're maximizing the you're opportunity. maximizing there. the space. So, so it's interesting, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's <clears> interesting to see. And I, I go look at those posts and, you know, I do the same thing on every post as far as like how I, um, you know, write the title post, the H2 tags, the images, how I construct the post. But then I'm like, what are these, you know, I, I do have these like 10 or 15, like huge traffic posts. I'm like, okay, what's happening on these? You know, what's, what's making. So you're always out? watching those. You're always yeah. like, let me pay attention. Yeah. It's like star players, right? It's like, okay, totally. this is like, you know, 
the, it's the, also seasonal, you know, like um, in December, healthy homemade hot chocolate almost surpasses healthy homemade granola, right? Mm. But in July, that's not going to be the case. So, um, you know, for a blog like mine, it's a little seasonal. One thing that I would tell people to do, I know a lot of people listening to this are like, wow, I've just been spending so much time on Instagram. So I want to mention this real quick. Look at your top nine or your top posts from Instagram from the last year and freaking take a Saturday or a Wednesday and Thursday night and turn that into nine blog posts. Like whatever your highest performing content was, turn those into blog posts immediately. Get those onto a blog. That's nine posts. People are always like, what should I post on my blog? I don't know what to post. I'm like, if you have good uh, Facebook or Instagram posts, turn them into blog posts. So I was going to ask you about that in terms of like repurposing your content. Um, you know, like it sounds like you're a classic, your process is more of like a classic blogger. Like you sit down and you write you write an article, you're mm -hmm. not transcribing something or starting with something else. And then how much of that information do you post on social or does it, do you really treat them separate as like separate entities? You know, what's interesting, Rory, I don't, it's not that I treat them as separate entities. We do take, um, we link to my posts um, and we rotate through them on the Facebook feed. Uh, on Instagram, it depends. I do a story or, um, you know, a uh, post if it fits into the grid. But I really, for me personally, I see social media as like an accoutrement to my, to my blog. And it's really where people connect with me. So I do a lot of like face to camera stories and that kind of a thing where, and again, it's more the reach. And one thing I'm proud of, and I'll say, I've never bought Instagram followers or any social media followers. I've never purchased followers. So all of my followers are, le you know, legit real followers, which means also it hasn't grown as fast as some people who have you know, invested in different ways or maybe have purchased an audience. Um, so, you know, I have 20,000 ish Instagram followers, which is amazing. It's all, you know, uh, from just organically growing that. But when I know that I can have almost a million or more page views a month on my blog, that's where my time and effort is going. Uh huh. So, um, can we, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to the email list. Um, because you know, I mean, like, obviously we're, we're big, we're big fans of the blog, right? And we, we basically think of social media as just like traffic redirects. They're just like tributaries that like point, point people back, back to the blog. Um, and there's some other things that it does social proof, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, the, once they come to your site, all right, so you've got this title, like you've gone through, you've done all the tagging and all the all the steps uh, yeah. of, of the, you know, what you're going to do to to make sure it indexes well. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that are actually building the email list? And can you just talk about why that's important? Like, if you know there's a million people coming back every month, like, does it even really matter to build the email list? Um, oh yeah. yeah how do sure. you do it? Where do you do it? How often? Yeah. When? Like, talk, really talk about question. that a little bit. It's still absolutely important. You know, email is, this is the way I quit it. It's almost like to dating. Um, like if, if someone's going to ask you out on a date, social media is like meeting at a bar and maybe chatting with somebody and all your friends are there, right? Like you're not really that invested in it. Like maybe he's cute. She's cute. You're like having a little bit of a thing. Um, somebody coming to your website to me is like you're meeting that person for coffee, right? Like it's a little bit more intimate. You mm -hmm. like out of the noise. You're like, okay, we're going to have some coffee. Being on someone's email list is like inviting them into your living room, right? Or maybe, and I will say like in a cheeky way, like almost your bedroom, because a lot of people wake up in the morning and they get on their phones and they start scrolling. And guess what? You might be on their, you, they might be on your email list and mm -hmm. you're the first person that they see in the morning. Like that's like a legitimately like real thing that happens. It's mm -hmm. like this deeper level of intimacy because there's been an exchange. You gave them, they gave you their email address. Um, and generally what, you know, people call these different things like, a big banana, like, you know, that everybody on the internet's monkeys and you need to like, you know, have a bunch of bananas that people can grab. I don't love that analogy as much. You know, it's just the free download on your website, right? Like that you're, you're exchanging value. They're giving you their email address and you are giving them something for free. Classic website, lead, lead magnet, like yeah, just lead magnet. Classic. right now on my website, um, we've got a, uh, five, five healthy, um, habits that you can implement today for immediate results or, you know, an eight page guide. And one thing, you know, which was actually something that like I had this dawned on me, I should have done this way sooner because my email list would probably be even bigger. That's in the header of every single blog post on my website. My what? lead magnet is in the header oh. of every single um, blog post on my website. 
So when somebody lands there, it's, it's, it's at the top no matter what. It's also underneath every single post. I keep my sidebar pretty um, clean of things just because on mobile and traffic's going mostly mobile, I think 60 or 65% of my traffic is mobile. They don't see the sidebar anyways. Um, so don't, you know, the sidebar, it's not a bad thing to use, but um, I, I have the sign up. There's one above the post, one below the post, and then there's a scroll pop up that once somebody gets, I think it's 30 or 40% through the page, it pops up and is like, hey, do you want this free thing? Mm -hmm. um, what are you using for the scroll pop up? Do you know? Well, I, my WordPress, my site is WordPress. Um, it's designed on show it, but the blog is WordPress. And I think we're using pop-up ally pro right now is the WordPress plugin for okay. the pop-up. Um, that might change in the future, but I think that's just the tool that we're using and it's worked well. And then I use active campaign for email. So whenever somebody subscribes anywhere on the website, they get funneled into active campaign. And is there a certain percentage? Like if you go, is there a certain percentage that you aim for every month? If you go like, Hey, so if you're getting a, if you're getting a, you know, call it a million because it's easy numbers. If you're getting a million page views or visitors, I guess if you're getting a million, did you, those are page visits, page right? Views. Those page are page views. views. Yeah. So, so that could be, um, could be the same person, right? So, yeah. and then also what That's I wonder. Usually a million page views, it depends on the month, honestly, the series is probably 200,000 to three or 400,000 people. Could be more could be less, but uh -huh. uh, you know, it just depends. It totally depends. But then it's like, and then some fraction of those people, mm -hmm. like a, a large, I would, I would think at this point, some large number of those are people who have been there before, but then yeah. there's also going to be a pretty big chunk just because of the volume here that are new people. Yes. Is there a certain percentage or anything that you go like, I want to see my email list growing by this percentage every month, or yeah. do you watch um, that closely or not really? Yeah, I, it's, I'm, I'm definitely into analytics and I watch that, but I also focus, I try to focus the majority of my effort on just serving the audience and blogging. Although I will say we're aiming for a thousand or more signups from organic Google traffic a week um, onto the email list. And, okay. and I would like to continue to scale that and, you know, the next will be 1500 and then 2000. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's about what we're at. I will also say with my email list, we very actively dump Keep dump. That's a terrible word, right? Just but go ahead. Well, that's your dating analogy. analogy. Yeah. Your dating analogy, right? We dump people who are inactive. And this is really, really important. So on the email list, because people, what here's what happens. A lot of things happen. Someone signs up, they miskey their uh, email address. That, so it's never going to, you know, it might bounce or it might be going somewhere. Or somebody changes jobs. 30% of email addresses are abandoned every year. So just think about wow, that. Wow. That's crazy. So think about like a previous job or maybe somebody changes their last name or they, or they just are like, wow, I'm so over this email address or people have like a catch all email address for the, their, their signups. You know, it's not their primary email address. Um, there's, there's a variety of reasons or they're just not interested. So I can't, I think um, ours is set. It's, and I give them a good amount of time. It's like three or four months. If they haven't opened an email, it triggers an automated re-engagement campaign trying to be like, Hey, here's, here's another free ebook. Like here's another freebie first. And then a few days later, here's another one. So we give them a lot of opportunity to stay, but if nothing's being opened, we dump them. They're not on the active email list anymore because that, that hurts your open rates and it, it skews all of your numbers. So we really actively dump people. Interesting. Do you delete them completely from the system or do you just put them in a bucket of people you don't send email to? I want to delete them because I just like energetically <laughs> like to see the number as is. However, uh -huh. we keep them, well, and it depends on what system you're using. Yeah. It's good to keep Because you them. also pay for them. Well, no, actually an active campaign in most of them, if they're not on any list, you're not paying for them. So it doesn't hurt to keep them. Gosh, if I was paying for them, I would probably delete them because I'm at such a, the more your email list grows, the more you pay. And I'm not going to pay for people who aren't opening emails, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So if you're on a system that you are paying for it, I would suggest considering deleting them. However, in the system that I use, we're only charged if they're on a list. So we just remove from all lists. And then the data is there historically in case like, this is more of just a general best practice in customer service and technical stuff. You want to keep people there because if they resubscribe two years later and they're asking for something, you can see, oh wait, you subscribed two years ago. It just gives you a history. Right. It's probably not a big deal to delete them. Again, my, you know, active campaign um, consultant and specialist is like, no, we need to keep them. So I'm like, fine, if that's the best practice, we will. 
who is also a client, a client of Brand Builders Group, uh, and we love yeah. her, and we're so grateful for her. Um, Lindsay Kirsch, yes, yeah, she's amazing. So, wh- how often? So, do you email your list every time you post a blog? Yes, yes, you do. Mm-hmm. And is but that? I don't what, just copy and paste. So, um, I tell people do not use RSS feeds. There's you should. No one's going to open those, right? People want emails that are written to them and that are personal. Just it used. To, that's such an old thing to do, like an RSS feed, where it was like, oh the uh, blog post triggers and it just goes to everybody. People know that, that they're not gonna read that. So, and, and besides that, your email subject line needs to be different than the post title because if you tell people what the post title is, they're probably not gonna open the email because they'll just know, oh, if I ever want it easy to peel hard boiled eggs, I'll come back and open that, you know what I mean? Um, but I do send them a, li- a quick email with like maybe a little personal uh, line or two like about what I've been doing that week. And then I might copy the first few sentences and then there's an image and then it's read the post because you're always trying to get people back to the blog because then they'll go to more pages. They're more likely to see your services and they're engaging in your brand more. The goal of that email is to get them back onto the blog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So then, yeah. So once they're on there, so you're pushing, I mean, once your email list gets big enough, you're pushing your own traffic to some extent. I mean, at some whatever, 20% open rate or 3% yeah. click-through rate or whatever your email rates are, you're, you're exactly, driving yeah. a lot of that traffic. That's a good point. As your email list gets bigger, what happens is like I, I do the post and I will tell everyone, <laughs> I am consistent. I am definitely not perfect. And there's a big difference between those things. So I'm about, about to tell you what I want to happen every week, but this may or may not happen on this time frame. <laughs> Post the blog we're going to all be out looking next week yeah, to yeah, make sure yeah. that this happens. And then we'll be uh, sending. <laughs> exactly. Post a blog post on Monday. S- schedule the email to go out Tuesday morning. Sometimes I post it on Tuesday and the email goes out Wednesday morning. I like to send my, have my emails go in the morning. Um, and I do really realistically, it would be great to do one post a week, but really blog posts, I'm probably averaging three a month right now which is good. And again, that's consistent. Google really likes consistency on blogs and it doesn't have to be perfect. Again, don't mistake perfection with consistency. Um, so don't get down on yourself if you're like, oh, it's Tuesday and I didn't do it. You know, um, Just make sure that you're doing at least three to four posts a month. Heck, even if you just did two, you'd be doing better. What Google doesn't want to see is that you have all these blog posts and then you don't post for a year. And then right. you try to get back, you know, and you can rebuild that. So that's okay if that happens, but just try to be at least getting something up you know, three new posts. Um, and if, even if I don't write a blog post, I'll still email my list that week. And it might just be because I've been blogging for so long. Let's say I didn't get a post up this week. The email would just be like, um, you know, Hey, here's, here's five chocolate recipes to get ready for Valentine's day. And I can just link to five recipe chocolate recipes from the blog. Right. So it, it can be a new email linking to other things, old things. Yeah. How do you keep, how, how, how long have you been blogging? 12 years. So how do you keep coming up with new art, like articles after 12 years of doing three posts a month? Yeah. Like, don't you run out of stuff to say? No. So here's a few tips for people. I never run out of things to say. One, if you're doing, if you're blogging about something that you really genuinely are passionate about, and for me, that's healthy food, you will never run out of ideas. Like there's just, you know, and that might be, you know, when I think about recipes, I would never run out of recipes. There's always something new. But one one thing that really helps is like, if you go look, if you click on natural beauty or something on my site in that category, I'll do like the natural beauty series where some people would be like, here are the 10 best um, natural products. I'll call that the natural beauty series and I'll do 10 blog posts. Like one's castor oil, one's Manuka honey, like each one will get. So, so take something that normally would be a list and turn that into individual blog posts into a series. Like one of the, like one thing that I teach people in my program is like a year of content. You can create a year of blog ideas in one hour. If you just come up with like four or five like categories and then think about like three things that you want to teach in each category and turn each of those things into a series or into multiple posts. And you'll just never run out of, never run out of ideas. Interesting. Interesting, interesting stuff. Okay. So the uh, last little section I want to ask you about is just, um, a lot of our clients struggle with this, which is, you know, you are a nutritionist and a health coach, mm-hmm. but then you have a section of your blog that is about business. Yeah. It's, so, so to me, it's like, it's one thing if you have like health food 
and then, you know, maybe did like a series on healthy oils or something like that. Mm-hmm. But business seems kind of like a, a, seems like a little bit of a distance. Maybe it's not, but that's what I want to ask you about is like, yeah. Uh, you 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 have kind of gone ahead with just like keeping it together on the blog like how have you reconciled in your own mind like i'm uh, i'm i'm known for healthy like you broke through the wall with healthy recipes like yeah. Sheehan's wall to use that term which all yeah. of our listeners know about you broke through the wall with healthy recipes you're a you are a classic example of one medium a blog one topic healthy recipes, extremely consistent for years and years and years. One primary business model, which is information, a secondary business model of affiliates. Like you are such a great example, even though you weren't our client um, <laughs> you're of, of somebody who actually did, you know, the stuff, does the stuff that we, we teach and talk about. Um, and then, and then, so, so talk about the business piece. Like how did, when did yeah. that come in? How did you, was it like, oh, I'm on the other side of the wall. So fine. Or, um, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I didn't even know what the wall was, but I think here's, here's what it is. The business piece of my business grew from me figuring out the business on the health side and people being like, how are you doing that? What are you doing? Will you teach us? Right. So, so they were I'm asking like, you for it. Yes, people were asking, but I'm also just teaching what I'm doing. And I think if you look at it, like ultimately, yeah, like if you needed to pick a thing, it's healthy recipes that I broke through the wall. But that's also just what I was doing on a daily basis, right? I was blogging what was working for me. And when you look at these categories, they're all things that are working for me in life, right? Um, I am big, like I said before, like on your blog, pick three to five categories, right? Um, Business, I, I, I did kind of, I was like, should I just... I, w- I debated having business as a category. I'll tell you that because I see what you're saying. Like it can be confusing. Like somebody lands here for granola. What's this thing about business? But what they're seeing is that I'm running a business, right? When they, somebody lands on my blog, I'm running a business. So I think, you know, that category in my mind is there for someone who's like, wow, I want to run a business like this. How would I do that? And if someone's not interested in that, they just want the healthy recipes then they can just get the healthy recipes. Uh, so that's just one of your five categories. It's just like this, mm-hmm. this thing that's kind of over here. And yeah. um, I think what's interesting too, is that your audience was asking for it. That is sort of telling, right? If you're serving the audience and they're asking for it. Um, um, yeah. So anyways, I just, I thought that was, I thought that was really interesting. And you do, I mean, you do a lot of business from your business portion of your site. I mean, you, you've done uh, I mean, you've, you're one of the top affiliates for Marie Forleo and several other business mm-hmm. people like, um, and that, and that's, I think the the part that's so cool about it is like, that's who you are. Like you're interested in business, you're learning business, you're constantly, you know, we, we actually met, um, cause you were at Lewis's mas- Lewis house mastermind and I was yeah. there and that's how we met. And so it's like, clearly that's just like a hobby and passion of yours. And it's kind of true to the roots of the web blog concept of like, I'm blogging about my life. Um, yeah, totally. It's yeah, that's exactly it, Rory. It's like, I view my blog and like everything I do now is, you know, I figure out what works for me and then I, I put it on the blog and I'm not saying that, you know, everybody has to do this. I'm not, it's not like, this is the one way that will work for everyone. I don't say that with food and nutrition. I don't say that with business. I tell everybody, you need to figure it out for yourself, what way works best for you. But I view everything I do now, especially, you know, via the medium of the blog of like, I feel a responsibility, right? In the different areas of success that I've had with my own health, with the business that I've grown, uh, you know, with, with what I've learned to share that and to say, Hey, this is an option for people. You know, even working with brand builders group, I want people to know that I've gotten a ton of value from you. And I've had so much value from our interactions that I want people to know that I got value from that. And I want people to work with you. You know, B-School is the same way. Like somebody just emailed me yesterday. They're like, Liz, if you have your own business program, why on earth would you, you know, be an affiliate for another business program? Mm. And I'm like, because it changed my life. It, it, Mm. It legitimately changed my life. And there are people on my email list who might be like a photographer or a, a business strategist, or, you know, I had a woman who came through who wanted to start her own toothpaste line, like, you know, all these different things. I feel like I'm doing a disservice to the world, to the email list, if I don't share what taught me to do what I'm doing now, if that makes sense, you know? Wow. So, and I don't view it as competition or cannibalizing. I think any business program I teach works in synergy with anything else that I recommend, right? We all need to learn from multiple teachers. So I don't view it as like, 
you should do one or the other. I'm like, look, go learn from a lot of people, um, see who you resonate with and, and learn from a lot of people. But, you know, at this point, it's still why, you know, on my website under become a health coach, you'll see the Institute for Integrated Nutrition, because that's how I became a health coach. So, you know, there's this old model of wanting to keep our secrets for ourselves or, you know, the secrets to success that people don't mm -hmm. want to share or, you know, cause we feel like, well, what if I share this and somebody becomes more successful than me? In my view, I've done my job as a mentor and as just a citizen of the planet. If I can share something with somebody and they do better than me, that's good. That's what I want. I want people to build bigger blogs, bigger businesses. I want somebody to become a more famous health coach, you know, have a higher traffic recipe blog. Like that's good, right? That, that's why we're here. And it's, it's, it's so, I don't even know what the word is. It feels, it's, it's awful to think, well, I'm going to do all this, but I'm not going to tell anybody how. Like, I don't want to live that way. Wow. That's such like classic scarcity versus abundance mindset. Um, absolutely love that about you. Totally got goosies listening to that. I mean, that just the, the mindset of just what has changed my life and just wanted to help people. Um, Liz, where should people go if they want to connect with you? Uh, obviously, ElizabethWriter.com and the health habit, the book, and we'll link all that. What, what else? Yeah. Anything else? Uh, ElizabethWriter.com, get on my email list. I send people a lot of free eBooks. And the longer you're there, the more free recipes and eBooks and just insider stuff that you get. Uh, the book's on Amazon. I'm on Instagram. I do lots of uh, stories. But yeah, however, here, here's what I tell people. However they want to connect, we'll connect. I'm, I don't do Snapchat. I don't do TikTok. You know, I, I have my few mediums and I would love for people to come over to the website. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. This was hugely valuable, a totally uh, powerful perspective that I don't think people hear enough about and really appreciate you opening the door to like, uh, you know, just the all the behind the scenes of your business. So thank you for supporting us and we're cheering you on and we, we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.